Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Hello, my name is Hei Yeonju. Um, I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto. I'm also the director of the Center for the Study of Korea here at the University of Toronto. It's a great honor for me to be uh, opening this event uh, with the really amazing uh, translators and commentators on this um, the book launch of Park Young Lee's The Age of Doubt. Um, I'm uh, per personally a translator myself, and you know, it's a very isolating work. Often it's very solitary. So the moment like this where we can come together to be in conversation with other translators and to talk about our experiences and to celebrate is a really big moment. And it's amazing that we can host this event at the University of Toronto. And it's thanks to our own uh, Sophie Berman who proposed the event and also is a part of the edited volume. So I am so thankful for Sophie for doing this. And Sophie will also be moderating and organizing the session. But before we begin, um, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, um, the Literature Translation Institute of Korea, who um, supported this event, and also the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. And uh, last but not least, um, our amazing Dasha Kuznetsova, who make um, all our events possible. So thank you so much. And thank you again for joining. Let me now turn it over to Sophie Bowman. Thank you, Professor Chu, um, and welcome everyone. So I also want to thank Dasha at the ASIM Institute and also Professor Chu for all the work that they've done to make this event possible. And thank you to Grayson for designing our wonderful poster and graphics. Hopefully some of you saw it, saw them around the internet. Um, I even pasted some around the school and they look awesome. Um, so yeah, I should also thank the sponsors as well. Center for the Study of Korea um, really generously agreed to host this and it's actually a lot of work, even an online event, especially when we have so many speakers. Um, but I think it's really important that we're all together here. Um, and yeah, LTI Korea and the Department of East Asian Studies um, also chipped in really generously to help um, with this event. Uh, I also want to give a big thank you to our speakers and discussants for making the time for this event. I know it wasn't easy. Um, and to everyone who's tuning in, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully some more people will trickle in, but um, we'll also have a recording available later. So we have something for posterity and anyone who wants to listen again. Um, I can also see some familiar names on the list, which is very exciting. <laughs> thank you for joining us um, and welcome. So um, we're here today to talk about The Age of Doubt, this gorgeous book by Humphrey Star that they made so quickly. Um, they're really speedy, independent um, publisher. Um, and it's a collection of stories by Park Kyung Ni. Uh, five of the stories were written between 1955 and 1958, and the remaining two were written in the late 1960s. Um, I just want to give a brief biographical sketch of the author, although we're here to talk about translating and trans the translators. Um, I think it's a nice opportunity to think about um, her a bit more. So uh, Park Yong was born in 1926 in Tongyang on the southern coast of the Korean peninsula during the years of Japanese colonial rule. Um, she graduated from Jinju, High, Jinju Girls High School in 1945 and made her official literary debut 10 years later. In those 10 years, she had gotten married, had a brief teaching career, given birth to two children, lost her husband and her young son in quick succession, survived the Korean War and become the breadwinner for the remaining members of her family. So if you've read the stories, you'll kind of see that there are quite a lot of parallels with her um, with her kind of life story to, to that point. Um, Park often emphasized that she would never have become a writer if she had been happy with her life. Um, she was an avid reader from a young age, including Russian, French and English literature and Japanese translation, and she was always captivated by the stories that her grandmother um, used to tell. So Park wrote many novels and plenty of other short stories as well. I think she's probably one of the most prolific Korean authors ever to have lived, um, but she's most famous for Toji 
Um, it's an epic novel that she began serialising in 1969 and completed in 1994, over 25 years. Um, the novel has five parts and it's 7,000 pages um, in Korean. It spans the period from 1897 to 1945 and it has a cast of hundreds of characters. Um, it was also adapted into a long-running television series. Park Young Lee passed away in 2008 and later in life she was a very vocal environmentalist. She was also very deliberate about her legacy, setting up the Toji Cultural Foundation with a centre in Wonju that still hosts writers and artists' residencies to this day. Whew. So, The Age of Doubt, the book that we're all here to talk about translating, um, in the book we can see her kind of experiments as a published writer. Um, in a kind of working outward from a semi-autobiographical work towards this fast project that she says that she had in mind even before the Korean War. Um, and we are joined today by six of the translators, including me, <laughs> who worked on this collection. And each of us will speak for about 10 minutes. I don't know what people are going to say. I'm very excited. It could be anything. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> And after that, we'll hear from three discussants from the university community and move on to responses from the speakers and hopefully some questions from the audience too. Um, we have a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen that you can use to submit your questions anytime during the talks. Um, yeah, so I'll introduce the speakers. Uh, myself, I am a PhD student here at the University of Toronto. I research post-war Korean fiction by women authors. Um, I've also been translating for about 10 years, um, and my published work includes a co-translation with Sung Yu, who I think I can see in the list here. Hi, Sung. <laughs> um, the book is I'm Waiting for You and Other Stories by Kim Boyle. Um, Yu Jong Kim is a translator and editor based in Seoul. She was the overall editor for this collection and also translated the commentary at the end of the book. Um, she is a graduate of the LTI Korea Translation Academy and was one of the winners of the 47th Modern Korean Literature Translation Awards in 2016. She works translating and editing literary and media content, including children's stories, scenarios, pansori, and subtitles. Uh, Paige Anaya Morris is a writer and translator from Jersey City, New Jersey. She holds BAs in Ethnic Studies and Literary Arts from Brown University and an MFA in Creative Writing from Rutgers University, Newark. She has received awards from the Daesan Foundation, the American Literary Translations, Translators Association and the Fulbright Program. Her translations from Korean have appeared in various publications, including Azalea, Samovar and the Georgia Review. Dasom Yang is a writer and translator from Korea living in Berlin. She translated The, Art, the Age of Darkness for this collection, um, which I know I'm not alone in having not been able to sleep for quite a long time after reading. Um, she's working on a book of essays on love, language, migration and memory, and you can find a selection of her work at dasomyang.com. Anton He was double longlisted and shortlisted for this year's International Booker Prize with Love in the Big City and Cursed Bunny. He graduated from Korea University College of Law and Seoul National University Graduate School and currently divides his time between Seoul and Songdo. He recently signed a contract to write a novel in Korean for Ikta Publishing. He is a novelist <laughs> and you can find his links to a whole bunch, uh, uh, you can find links to a whole bunch of his writing at antonher.com. Uh, including The Great White Cancelling, which is one of my per personal favourites. Um, and yeah, Mato Mandeslut is an, an, an Amsterdam-born literary translator, currently based in Jacksonville, Florida. A former full-time Taekwondo athlete, he studied classics, translation and Korean studies in London and Oxford. He translates from Korean into Dutch as well as English, and his translations include works by best-selling authors such as Sun Hwang and Sang Young Park. Although I've been speaking for a long time, I also want to give a quick shout out to the two translators in the book who are not joining us as speakers today. Slyn Jiang, who translated Black is Black, White is White, is a freelance translator and interpreter, and her first full book translation was published this May by Verso. It's a 500 page work titled Gwangju Uprising, The Rebellion for Democracy in South Korea. Um, 
and I would encourage anyone who is interested um, in that event and the stories surrounding it to go and check it out. Uh, Emily Yewan, who translated Retreat, is a literary translator based in Seoul and has translated works by Ali Smith, Juno Barnes and Deborah Levy into Korean. Her book translations into in English include Hwang jong -un's I'll Go On, The Tilted Axis Press and Hang Gang's Greek Lessons, co-translated with Deborah Smith, which is coming out next April. So, whew, thanks for listening to all that. Um, so first I'm going to ask Yujong to speak and then each of the translators will uh, pass over to the next speaker. Thank you, Yujong. Hello, uh, my name is Yujong and as Sophie introduced me, like, um, I was the editor of the Age of Doubt project and I also um, translated uh, the uh, Professor Kang Ji-hee's uh, commentary at the end of the book. Uh, first, maybe um, I can introduce, I can explain uh, what Hong Fu Star mainly does first. You know, Hong Fu Star is a, an independent publishing company uh, which seeks to introduce great literary works of East Asia to English readers. Uh, I joined the team as an editor for this project for this specific project in August 2021, uh, when Anthony and Taylor, the two co-founders of Hong Star, were considering uh, publishing a, a modern Korean female uh, writer's work. So at first we had some candidates on our list, but as soon as we found out that, you know, Park kyung short stories have never been translated into English, we were like, oh, yeah, we should do this. Our next project should be about Bakyeongmi. So that's how we kind of decided on Bakyeongmi's stories. Um, Sophie already explained, but Bakyeongmi is the legendary figure in Korean liter literature. So she's most famous for a 20 uh, volume epic saga, Toji, uh, meaning land. Uh, she worked on Toji for over 25 years. Uh, the series is still loved to so many Korean readers and it's still one of the best sellers in Korea. So, um, I think I was one of the uh, most lucky people who read all the translations of these excellent, you know, translations. Okay, earlier than anyone else. So I was really lucky. And I personally think that um, translating um, the commentary greatly helped me edit its story and understand better um, because, uh, you know, Professor Kang's uh, commentary provided in-depth analysis and deep insight into the period and background um, that Park young wrote about. Um, the collection has uh, seven stories. Um, I'm sure its translator knows their stories the best, so I won't talk about them in detail. Uh, so, like, but we have some similarities, like some of the stories are autobiographical and features very strong female protagonists, uh, just like Park young herself. Like, they are a widow who lost her husband and, you know, her son, uh, and has to financially support their, the rest of her family, or a single woman who suffers from men's biased views or fateful love. So the stories may sound a bit personal, but its story actually touches the social issues as well, like a crumbling uh, healthcare system, challenges to the patriarchy, and women's empowerment. Like the time setting is uh, old; it varies from like the Japanese occupation to the aftermath of the Korean War in the late 1950s. But the stories still resonate with the contemporary readers giving us an insight into the historical, cultural, and feminist context of these times. Um, given the husband's death in the war, the son's premature death, and the financial difficulties, these short stories may read a bit gloomy, hopeless, or desperate, but Park Young never loses the respect for human dignity and integrity. I think this is a penetrating, the penetrating theme throughout her short stories in the collection. So uh, I also, um, we also have a passage relevant to this theme um, in the Professor Kang's commentary. Let me read that part. Uh, it's not long. Um, 
Uh, indeed, no Korean writer has a better objectively depicted how mortification and violence affected the survival of women characters in the post-war than Park Kyung-min. Instead of letting her ego compromise the reality, Park pursues a human dignity and fascinates herself with a romantic love, going beyond the fate and social institutions. The short stories in this collection show how Park Kyung-min overcame her personal tragedies, moved the Korean people's minds, and further became a seminal figure in Korean literary history. Um, and I, as I said, I edited uh, seven different translators' works, and this is a really unique and interesting opportunity. So maybe I can talk more about my experience as an editor of the Age of Doubt pro project. Um, in fact, I was not the only uh, editor for this project. Anthony and Taylor also involved were involved in the editing process as well. Uh, so we were basically a team of the three editors. Uh, we reviewed our translators' drafts several times. I think our translators already know this process, but we exchanged the documents three or four times uh, before you know the both parties were finally satisfied with the, our final version. So we often had internal discussions on specific issues, and the translators sometimes solved the problems for us. So we kind of had a multi-layered editing processes. So I don't think I need to emphasize this, but these seven translators are top-notch Korean English literary translators. So I was very proud that Hong First Star was able to gather these excellent translators in one place for the Age of Doubt project. Um, just uh, they are amazing. So well, we tried to suggest some alternatives to, to their choices rather than kind of push our thoughts and the translators actually had their final say. So we wanted to work with um, these different translators to deliver their diverse voices across uh, the stories, the different stories, and to make the collection a lot uh, richer. We didn't have any strict rules for the matter of a cohesion. All the stories have distinct characteristics and different charms. The age of Doubt and the Age of Darkness may almost look like a, a twin stories, but they are still stand alone independent stories. So we try to respect its tr translator's style as much as possible. And I think it worked out really well in the collection. So as a translator myself too, I learned to read a lot just by reading their beautiful translations. But um, I, I won't exactly call this a downside, but it took uh, more time editing than usual because I had to switch among different you know, translators' works. So they are all amazing translators and they have all different styles. So once I get used to, get used to a translator style, then I had another one <laughs> coming with a different styles. So um, I had a big long good time, it's time I had to switch to the next story. But still, you know, I really enjoy the process. So, and I'm a, I'm a native Korean speaker and a big fan of Korean literature. So of course I had a passion for this project. I grew up uh, watching my mom read the Tootsie and I also read the Tootsie when I was uh, young. So editing the translation of uh, Park Young-li's work was uh, such an honor. And it made me feel very proud. And this is none other than Park young works. I thought that many Korean readers would be also very interested in its translation. So I wanted to make sure we have as few mistranslations as possible. So I first read the entire draft without referring to the source text. And later I compared the translation with the Korean text line by line. Um, but some terms are very old and unfamiliar even to Korean natives. So Anthony Taylor and I, not to mention our translators, had to do some extensive research. Um, for instance, I called my mom to ask about K, G, Y, E, a private money lending circle in Korea. Um, I, I heard of the term, um, but I didn't know exactly how it works. But that the term repeatedly appeared throughout Park Young-li's stories, revealing how common you know, 
the practice was at that time. So I needed some help from my mom. And in the era of a fantasy, um, the, a term uh, writer sleep appears. And we three editors struggled to understand the meaning for a long time. And finally, Anthony found out that it meant a piece of a document that the Japanese Imperial Army um, sent to you for conscription. So we, all, we had some other cases, of course. Uh, we had to put our heads together to figure out the meaning. But I really enjoyed the time discussing the original text with the various translators and hearing our opinions. And I was always amazed at how these translators were able to come up with a lot better suitable solutions and brilliant expressions than our original suggestions. Um, lastly, um, many people are wondering why Hongpo Star worked with seven different translators for one short story collection. So actually, uh, we are aiming at a long-term bigger project now. The publishing company is uh, discussing the possibility of translating and publishing uh, Park Yamni's uh, This will be a truly daunting task, but we've already experimented working with the multiple translators at, you know, at the same time through the age of doubt. And as you can see, the outcome is fabulous. So, so nothing has been confirmed yet, but we are trying to make things happen now. And if we can ever embark on this project, it will require a lot more cooperation among translators because a 20 volume epic saga is different from a collection of independent short stories. But we think um, this is a perfect timing. K literature, K -literature is a garnering a lot of popularity you know, these days. Um, and we have uh, amazing translators. You know, here we have Anton, his translation, Curse Bunny, Honor the Home for the Stars publication was shortlisted for, you know, the Booker International Prize. And, um, and I, I think I heard some of our translators are uh, scheduled to release their Korean their translations um, through major publishing houses. So in a word, we, are, we already have a, so many uh, great translators, we have to do something <laughs> with them. So, and of course, without, you know, these translators, we want to dream of, you know, taking the plans, but we we sure it's gonna work. Uh, and Park Young-hee wrote the Age of Doubt stories in the 1950s and 1960s, but the collection still kind of stands out among a lot, many contemporary translations. The fact that her stories still resonate with this, so many contemporary readers uh, proves the power of her narrative and her theory world. And I'm sure the Tuesday project will shed more light on Akemi's worldview and her work will fascinate English readers as much as it continues to mesmerize Korean readers. So uh, the first uh, story of uh, uh, the collection is a uh, Calculations, and so I will pass over to Pace Marie. Thank you so much, uh, Yoo Jung, and uh, to everyone for organizing and uh, inviting me to take part in this conversation. Um, as mentioned, I'm Paige and I'm Morris, and I translated the first story in The Age of Doubt, Calculations. Um, and yeah, I'll talk a little about how that happened and uh, the process of doing that. So I guess to start, um, similarly, I was contacted by Anthony and Taylor at Hanford Star, our publisher, um, late, maybe early fall last year. And um, yeah, that speaks to how quickly the project came together, which is really impressive. But at that time, I was invited to join what seemed to be like a super team of translators that was being assembled. And uh, the invitation itself was a huge honor, but also incredibly intimidating and terrifying. So I thought a lot about um, what I could bring to the project and my particular skill set, um, what I had translated before, um, and just what I would be able to do with the work of a cultural icon. Um, so at that time, Anthony and Taylor asked, I, I guess this was maybe true for all of us, asked us to rank our preferences for what story we would most want to uh, translate and work on. 
And at that time, I ranked calculations first, actually. And there were a few reasons for that. I think content-wise, I resonated a lot with Payne, the, the protagonist's um, position, uh, which was mentioned, right? A, a woman, a single woman who's kind of struggling against social expectations, social contracts. And I wanted to translate a character like that. But I think I also was mostly focused on the position of that story being uh, Park kyung mis first published story. It was published in 1955. It was her debut as a writer. And I thought at the time it felt fitting for me as a, an early career translator to take on a work by a writer who was at that time also early career, right, still developing her voice, her themes. Um, I think later, of course, she would come to be known for um, particular themes, particular events that she portrayed in her fiction. Um, but there's there's a little bit, I guess, less pressure in translating the first where someone is still kind of figuring things out uh, alongside me translating. So uh, I wanted to work on the first story. And I chose the story for that reason. And in getting started reading the other stories, reading the story again and again, um, before even starting to translate it, I kind of knew I was in over my head still, <laughs> just because I could immediately tell there was going to be a lot of research, uh, a lot more research required to tackle the story than for previous projects I'd worked on. Um, a large part of that, I think, is because there were just pretty much every possible barrier kind of between myself and the story that I was working on. And I wanted to do as much as I could to close a, a lot of that distance. So for one thing, um, the story predates my existence by 40 years. Um, so that was a big challenge to overcome. It, I think it predates yeah, my parents' existence as well by at least a decade. So I was many generations removed. I also am a Black American translator working on a story by a Korean writer. Um, so there were geographical, national distances. Um, so working across time, space, kind of every element of difference you can imagine, I was really, I was really concerned with getting it right um, to, to the best of my ability. So my research process, um, I guess I should also say I was not ever formally or institutionally trained in Korean studies, Korean history. Um, so a lot of the research process for me was trying to get a sense of what daily life was like at the time and how it would be rendered in a literary sense, right? A more journalistic account of daily life. Um, so I you know, was translating at the height of the pandemic. So I, could, I had to do the best I could with Google. Um, so Google was really helpful, um, Namu Wiki, Wikipedia, all of the usual suspects uh, really came in handy in terms of finding old images, um, which was really helpful for me to visualize what these neighborhoods that, you know, I'd only experienced in the 21st century American and Korea context, um, what they looked like and what, um, what people's experience of those places and um, just kind of daily interactions would have been like. Um, so I spent like a lot more time than I'd expected looking at pictures of like old streetcars and um, Dongdae Moon at the time, Seoul Station at the time. Uh, also, I I had never um, seen Kwan, the currency at the time, so I like spent a lot of time looking at like just what does the money that people are using look like. Um, and even though those details, I think, only made it into the translation in a sentence or two or a passage here or there, I think the process of looking into all of those things and trying to visualize was really helpful um, in getting a sense of how I could like be as immersed in this story as possible despite all of the distance I think between myself and the text. Um, so yeah with that being done I did get down to translating and found the story itself incredibly resonant still. Um, I think Yujung spoke to how timeless a lot of the themes and um, ideas that Park Kyung-mi's work grapples with are. Um, so I found um, understanding and, and really resonating with the characters to be simpler than just getting the kind of nitty gritty details right. Um, but I hope that the research that went into it um, paid off. And um, I think one other thing I can say about the process was 
um, I think also like Yu Jung mentioned, for me at least, I did not see anyone else's translation or process until the book came out earlier this fall. And when I was reading, I just read the collection cover to cover. I just felt, I was like amazed, of course, like at how this all came together. And I remember feeling like it was like peeking into everyone's little studio space. Like maybe we had all been in the same huge cabin somewhere, like isolated and writing or, or translating. And um, reading the collection was like getting a kind of sneak peek into everyone's little studio space. Um, but also it was cool to see that even though we were working in these kind of like siloed areas, it felt like there were a lot of places where it felt like I could kind of see maybe the light from one person's studio, like leaking into someone else's room. Like I, I could see common um, choices that were made or common readings um, and naturally the stories that had common themes, I think cohered a lot more than one would expect with seven different translators working on the story. Um, so the process itself was done in isolation, but I think getting to see the final collection come out, I, I realized that there was still a lot of connective tissue happening, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So um, that was cool to see. And I'm excited to hear how it was for everyone else. Um, like for me, working kind of by myself and feeling a lot of pressure um, in taking on this particular writer, um, from my particular position, it was really reassuring to see what good company I was in and to um, also learn a lot from reading their translations in the end. So yeah, that was my experience and I'm excited to hear from everyone, but for now, I'll pass it on to Mato. Thank you, Paige, for sharing your thoughts. Um, so, um, I'll also mention uh, how I got to translate. Oh, my name is Mato, and uh, I'm now based in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, but I'm from Amsterdam, and I met uh, Yu Jung in Seoul when I was living there for the last uh, two, well, I moved here a year ago, uh, but uh, for the past two years, I was in Seoul, the two years before that, and that's where Yu Jung and I met at the LTI Translation Academy. Um, and uh, the reason why I got to translate the story I translated uh, has is maybe less thoughtful than Paige's reason, uh, because I just happened to be in between two bigger projects. Um, so uh, like, like has been said, uh, the, the turnaround for this uh, translation was quite fast. It was a fast paced project. And I, I just mentioned that I had uh, some free time, so I was happy to do the, the longest story. Um, so that's how uh, that came about. Um, and um, I'll just talk a bit about a few translation um, issues, uh, maybe in chronological order, if you like. So I'll start with um, meaning, because when I translate, the first thing I try to do is get the meaning right. Then I'll turn to style. And so like tell a little bit about how um, Pakyamni's particular style, um, well, I, I tried to grapple with it. And then I'll end with a, um, maybe a, a daring theory about um, anachronisms, because this was my first work also that isn't contemporary. Like I've only translated contemporary authors. And so I was also scared at first that I would um, make huge mistakes and and um, totally take it take the text out of its context and and deliver something that was out of line. Um, but in the end, I'm, I'm I think what I did worked, um, and I, I I would like to share it with you and see what you guys think about it. Um, so in terms of meaning. Um, this book, more than contemporary um, authors, um, uh, required some some digging, and like um, I would like to see translators as detectives at some times, um, because we really like page that you have to like hunt on the internet for for clues. And um, a particular example that I have is that the characters in my story were playing some games uh, that I'd never heard of, like children's games. Um, 
and um, I had to watch some YouTube videos of how these games work, and they were pretty hard to find. Um, so that took some some research, and then it's it's really time consuming. So at some point, I was really thinking like, why don't I just translate the words and forget about it? Like I'll just like stay stay close to the meaning do a literal translation and let them figure it out uh, but then i said no i have to sit through this and try to make sense of it all and and then i noticed that after watching those videos and uh, almost cheering those little children on as they played those games um i i was able to deliver a, a much better translation so i would always encourage uh, translators to to keep doing their research, even though it, sometimes it feels like you're wasting your time. Um, but in the end, it pays off. Um, and um, then there was there were a few also phrases or, or, or words that I just wasn't familiar with because they were they're not used anymore. Um, and one particular um, case I'd like to share is that at some point, uh, one of the characters goes to um, which anyone would instinctively translate as to sell rice. Um, but this character in particular was uh, not from a farmer's family, although many of the other children are from farmer's families. She was the daughter of a teacher in, in, in high school or in school. And so when I started revising, I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like she, she's not selling rice. Um, and then I went on to uh, like search online and found uh, an article um, that said uh, <laughs> which means something like, um, wait, you're telling me selling rice means buying rice? Uh, and then I, 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 dig, I dug further to like um, some neighbor uh, cafes and, and blogs and people who were apparently struggling with the same issue. And it turned out that like, if you if you go to the Google Sajon, then the, the bottom most meaning for this word, uh, the verb in itself is uh, So it can actually mean the complete opposite of what I was instinctively translating it as. And I'm sure that a lot of people would think uh so in this case she was not selling rice she was buying rice uh and uh yeah that that really confused me and baffled me but it, after some research i uh uh i managed to find the right answer um then of course there's a there's a, a number of uh japanese references um that i also wasn't familiar with so i learned about uh naganitas I don't think I'm pr pronouncing anything correctly for uh, all Japanese words, but uh, they're kind of like swords that I had to find the image for to even get an idea of what they were. Uh, that were used in the Genpai War. Um, I learned about kamabokos, which are like Japanese cured uh, seafood bites. Um, uh, there was at the school of the the characters that are. Um, Playing the main roles in this story, there was a um, statue of a uh, Japanese farmer who uh, also turned into a philosopher uh, called Nino Ninomiyo Kinjiro. And luckily, uh, I could find pictures of this statue. Maybe not, of course, the particular statue in the book, but apparently, this the the pose that he uh, has in many in many of his depictions. Is always the same. So the one that she's describing is his kind of um, characteristic uh, pose. So that image also helped me to describe the the statue better. Um, and then I was very fortunate to have some help from Shanna, who I think is um, Anton's previous uh, mentee uh, uh, from the mentorship scheme, um, because she also translates from from Japanese. And I, I know very little about the Japanese language. And so there are a few um, dialogues where um, the, they're imitating um, their, their teachers who speak amongst themselves in Japanese. And I just didn't know what it meant. So I had, uh, I, I had to 
uh, first of all, transliterated because uh, in the Korean it's also just um, phonetic. Um, it's very phonetic. It's a phonetic phonetic phrase, and so the the meaning was between brackets. So I decided to do the same thing and just leave um, the transliterated Japanese in there, and then put the translation in English in between brackets. Um, so I had to find out a way to to transliterate it, and she helped me with that. And then sometimes she also like redirected me in terms of the meaning. Um, so that was I I couldn't have done the translation without her help either. So uh, also another reminder for translators to um, help each other out <laughs> uh, and make use of your expertise. Um, then uh, I would like to say something about uh, style. So I noticed um, for myself that I found her work very dense. Um, there was a lot of meaning compressed into a uh, few words sometimes. And so I, I, I noticed that the, my first draft was really uh, like the, the, the sentences stretched out, short sentences in the Korean became very long in the English um, because my first draft, like I said, I wanna get the meaning right. So usually I just, I just put all the meaning that's in that short sentence in my first draft and, and there's no other way than, than using more words. Um, and then, as you as I revised, I tried to cut those sentences back to their original length as much as I could, and so I ended up with um, phrases like um, "moss covered," uh, "dust laden," uh, "caterpillar like eyebrows," uh, "a tofu like face." So where where in in the Korean it, it would have been a descriptor in front of the noun saying like piri 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 hanan orgul or something um and and i in in english normally you would say a face that looks like blah blah blah, blah and then it always comes after the noun um but like i said that that really stretched out the sentences too much for me and they 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 felt lopsided and out of balance so that's why i tried to as much as i could kind of compress those um, uh, phrases back to just a singular adjective. And I mean, sometimes they're a bit innovative because I don't think moss covered is in the dictionary, um, but uh, it was a way to uh, deal with it. Yeah, sorry, I'll wrap up. So the last thing was the, the anachronisms theory, um, very uh, briefly. Um, you know how some people, and I agree with this, is um, if you um, have dialect, you don't want to use a dialect from the source language, from the target language of your translations, because then um, you, if you read the English translation, you think like, why is this person from Manchester suddenly living in, in Korea, right? And I noticed that when I was um, translating, I first wanted to use old English, like ha having my characters say blimey or, or something, because then I felt like, oh, I'm, I'm sticking to the time. But actually then when I read my translation, it felt more, my, my characters felt more fake and more fabricated that I felt like, why are old English people suddenly living in Korea? Um, so in the end, I actually didn't use many old words, especially in dialogue, um, and used just kind of natural language, what I felt was, was what I felt makes sense, like colorful language. Um, but I would love to hear your opinions on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Dasan. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Mato and Paige, for your perspectives. It was really interesting to hear from other translators, um, as always. And thank you, Sophie, for organizing and, and inviting me to this event. Um, I guess I'll start with sharing the process um, of translating the story. I translated the 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 Age of Darkness, um, which is the second longest story in the collection, I believe. Um, and I guess I'll share a little bit about how I got involved with the project, um, which dates back to 2019, I believe, when I was visiting in Korea and 
Um, I was originally, so Pakumni has always been one of the writers that I wanted to translate the most. Um, I grew up with her work, as as Yujung said. Um, I, she was one of my mom's favorite writers in Korean. Um, so I sort of grew up with Toji. I read it when I was in school. And, and you know, I think if you grew up in Korea and you studied literature in Korea, then then you would have sort of encountered her work in textbooks and, you know, literary um, um, exams and stuff like that. So I've always been familiar with her work. And and I guess that sort of, I had, because of that personal connection, I had the desire to sort of at least start looking into um, what I would do if I wanted to translate her work. Um, and the original project that I had in mind was Toji. Um, I guess because I like to, you know, um, <laughs> increase workload for myself. I don't know. I I just really like the idea of 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 that epic, the epicness of the of the project, and actually kind of taking on something that I believe is necessary work, and um, and to sort of have a have a jab at you know what can be done to to bring that about. Um, so. I think I just got I just got in touch with um, I emailed sort of cold emailed the the Toji Foundation in Wonju and and sort of asked around to see if the 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 rights were still available for the English translation of Toji and was very surprised to find that it it's it's never been actually translated in full I think the first two books were translated um, and then the the project sort of stopped midway because of the you know the vastness of the project and and the the lack of, I guess, the avail availability or the willingness from the translator there is part to kind of take on the project because it would be, I mean, it would have been a lifetime if if not more than that for one person to take on. Um, so I had I, I went to the I went to Wanju, which was, you know, it was lovely. The the foundation itself was really lovely, um, and spoke with the director there. And she was very, I mean, she was very welcoming and, and sort of gave me a lot of resources, but but at the same, at, at, I think at the time they were also kind of at a standstill in terms of clearing the rights, in terms of sort of like tra tracing who, you know, who was still the rights holder, because I think the original publisher had sort of went out of business. So like, I think it was kind of up in the air. Um, and as to like, who were they to, to kind of, um, to reclaim those rights, uh, so to speak. Um, and I think I posted, yes, I, I tweeted about that experience and just my, I guess, in general desire to to somehow kind of realize that project. And I think Anton and I got into a conversation on Twitter feed and sort of talking about like, you know, there maybe there could be a possibility for a group translation or or a kind of um uh collaborative effort between, you know, multiple translators to take on the project together. And then and then, and then a couple, I think like a year later or so, I, a uh, conference star um, got in touch with me and we started talking about this project. And, and I think at that point, we're both kind of um, baffled as to like, you know, how to go about this. But then I think they had this brilliant idea of, of starting the short story collection first and launching it as a kind of a way to sort of even kind of to, to test if this could even be feasible as, in terms of, you know, um, logistics of of bringing uh, multiple translators together for one book, and also to see if there's you know availability or willingness on the translators' part to kind of continue on to a larger project and and sort of commit to that for a long term. Um, so I was really really happy and excited when that when that sort of first came about and and when it started kind of kicking off and saw the list of translators that I've always admired and loved and. And, and and they're um learned from um so that was that was really great and that's kind of how I got into it and and like Paige said um we were sort of we were given the chance to sort of state our preferences um at the beginning of the project and I remember kind of reading through the book and 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 actually sort of remembering that I had read the age of at uh, the age of darkness um before uh, but I because because certain scenes sort of stood out to me the scene where example for example where Soon Young who's a war widower who's just lost her son to a basically a freak accident um is seeing the sort of the ghost of the son um sort of everywhere in 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 the hospital room 
And I remember being very sort of jarred by that imagery when I first read it in, in probably high school or middle school and kind of thinking about the trauma of that experience and, and, the, and the sort of, and the way that sort of, um, and the way that Pakyongni deals with that image imagery and the, and, the, and the experience as a whole, like leaving a lot of it unsaid as well as said, <laughs> I suppose. Um, and, and yeah, so I sort of, I think, yeah. And then, that, so I decided that would be my kind of the first choice if I had, if I were given the choice. Um, and luckily I was, I was guaranteed, I, were, I was given the, the, um, that story to translate. And in terms of like how, the, the actual process of, of translating the story, um, it wasn't easy for me, just because of it sort of personally overlapped with the period of my life where, where things were quite a bit difficult because my mom had fallen ill and and sort of dealing with that at the same time while tra while translating the story and kind of seeing a lot of parallels in between her uh, the the protagonist of the story and and my mom who's also kind of a product of an older older Korean society who was give who was kind of burdened with a lot of responsibilities to kind of care for her family and and to care for her um for her children as well that that was, I mean, at the same time, that was the kind of motivation behind me wanting to translate the story, but at the same time, sort of difficult to see the 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 amount, the sheer amount of sort of uh, cruelty that has kind of befallen on the character, and and seeing that kind of um, mirrored in my in my own family as well. Um, but I I suppose I could also say that that's what made the the process of translating. It that more um, that much more meaningful, um, and I also got a lot of help from my mom while she's still alive. Um, kind of getting getting sort of the references checked, or we're sort of kind of brainstorming with my parents about um, like certain words, or certain and and um, and certain like Japanese loan words that I wasn't really familiar with. Um, yeah, so that was that was a very, I mean, intense but very meaningful work, um, I would say. And when and when when I when the book actually came out, it definitely felt like a, sort of a milestone and sort of um, to be able to hold it in my hand and then like to see that it was out in the world. That was really great. Um, and as for the the book itself, I mean, I also hasn't I I also didn't get to read anyone else's translations before. Uh, the book actually came out and I, like Paige said it was really great to kind of read through the book and sort of see how the tr the stories sort of spoke to them uh, spoke to each other and there was a kind of several sort of running themes or styles that sort of resonated with each other um, and that was really um, kind of amazing to see even like well uh, full, fully knowing that we didn't it, even though it was a collaborative project we never actually collaborated on the pro uh, translate the translation pro uh, process itself so um yeah that was that was really meaningful and I don't think it's it's a kind of experience that a lot of translators get to have um so yeah I I really appreciated that and it kind of overall um this being a kind of a communal or or a collaborative project was one of the m most meaningful aspects of of the work um, to kind of to get the support of other uh, other translators and and sort of even like dur during the contract negotiation negotiating um, stage, I remember Emily sort of stepped up and sort of um, did a lot because she's uh, I guess one of the more senior <laughs> uh, translators uh, in in the group, so she sort of like was and she's always very very good with and. And very very meticulous with like certain terms and 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 kind of speaking up for translators' rights. So that was really helpful for her to kind of um, uh, be there for. I mean, she wasn't doing it for us, but she kind of was. Um, and that was that was great. Um, and yeah, in terms of the book, I mean, I, I really like the fact that this um, is a book that came out in the fifties, and it's a collection of stories that came out. Um, in the 50s and 60s but also it's still like resonating with us and the fact that I don't know I think I'll, there are a lot of great Korean literatures and Korean books being translated at the moment but but so many of them are contemporary and I feel like this 
the the way that this book was introduced and the way that this, this book is being talked about and and being sold um i feel like it could be a great opportunity for for it to sort of usher in more translations that aren't particularly contemporary or 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 um yeah coming like a very or like basically written by uh, writers that are still like, that are alive at the moment um and maybe more classical translations um that could um be that could be kind of shed a different light um now and yeah so I think it was it was really great and I would love to hear more from Sophie now Thank you, Dasam. Um, just I, for one, really loved your translation of that story. It was really, uh, yeah, I, could, I couldn't have done that. So thank you. Um, I will also uh, kind of just give a description of my work process. I don't want to be too repetitive, but I think it's something that people don't get to hear that often. Um, and yeah, so I, I also was contacted by Humphrey Star in July 2021. At the time, um, oh wait, let me time myself, sorry, no problem. <laughs> At the time, um, I was on leave from graduate school. I was four months into parenting for the first time in my life, and I wasn't really able to focus on um, reading in the way that I had hoped, even though I had, I was able to make kind of short periods of time to do my own thing. Um, but I found that I guess just out of habit, I was out, I was able to translate um, when I had those kind of nap time, night time, um, like little windows. Um, I'd read a short, a, a short story collection of Pak Yong Nis um, published by So Mundang um, before and also whichever um, translations were available in the dusty UNESCO <laughs> anthologies that we have here in Robarts Library. Um, so I wasn't that worried when Anthony at Humphrey Star just asked which story do you want to translate and I hadn't had time to read any of them. Um, I just thought okay I can't do the really really long one that's totally <laughs> unrealistic for me now. Um, so just any any one you like kind of thing. Um, and then they assigned me a story. I saw that it was about 45 pages in Korean and I thought okay that's fine I can do that. Um, and I actually had a scanned copy of the first publication um, which was in monthly literature or Dan Muna. So I was kind of proud of myself, you know, like, oh, I happened to have it and I was reading it, you know, the Karosugi, um, like, yeah, it's it's a different text orientation. And it felt really exciting to be like um, interacting with this text as a translator that was kind of had this age and weight of history to it. Um, so when I was reading through that scan for the first time, I went without the dictionary and I was just highlighting words that I didn't know as I went along. And my, my initial impression was just, oh, this is a fun rural melodrama. Oh, the characters, some of them are really dislikable, but also very understandable. And, you know, we have this very handsome man and these two women having a cat fight even. <laughs> Um, and I was just kind of like, okay, this is this is going to be fun. Um, the deadline felt like it was ages away and I just got on with other things. I had a lot going on and this story was always kind of the middle of my to-do list. Uh, but then when I did get down to doing the translation, um, I found that I was actually working really, really slowly, um, as slowly as I had done for my first um, story translations. You know, I, I used to print them out and like cut out the paragraphs and like <laughs> do all this stuff and it was it was that that slow. Um, um, and it was it wasn't about kind of words so much. So it was things um, like images, descriptions and these kind of throwaway remarks. And I knew all the words, but I didn't know necessarily what they implied or how to get what they implied into sentences in English that wouldn't be just very strange or you know how much to explain um, how much to hold the reader's hand um, and yeah it was I mean it's still a challenge <laughs> um, but I just did my best on that um, during one of the internet searches that I, I did throughout kind of trying to figure figure things out I found that this story was one of Park's practice runs for the much bigger project of Toji. 
Um, and actually scenes from the story that I translated were later incorporated into part one of, of um, that massive work. And once I knew that, a lot started to make sense. Like <laughs> all these things were like, oh, okay, that's why um, it's like this. So, um, for example, there are so many just really passing characters that come up in the story, and they're just there for a moment. But you get this impression that they have this huge um, weight of an elaborate backstory with them, and all of these villagers who just appear for a moment. They all seem to have known each other forever and kind of know the history of their families through generations. Um, and yeah, and I kind of, I didn't really know what to do with that. Um, I was already behind <laughs> in my translation, uh, but once I'd found out that this story was part of Koji, I felt this even bigger weight of responsibility. Um, even more than that, like um, in her, introduction to her translation of part one of Toji, Agnita Tennant, um, wrote that among the secondary plots included um, in that uh, first part, the story of the love of Yongi and Wilson, which is um, the story of the sickness and the medicine can fix, has an unsurpassed beauty and stands out among all the other subplots. So the story I was translating wasn't just a part of Toji, it was this part that stuck out to someone who had translated over a thousand pages of it. <laughs> And now I had this kind of amazing opportunity, I guess, to focus on just that, that subplot in Park's uh, initial writing. And it felt like this kind of wonderful luxury, but also it was a lot of pressure. Um, and yeah, so there were lots of feelings <laughs> going on um, when I was trying to do the work. Uh, so it's not very usual for me, but no matter how hard I tried, when I was doing my initial draft, there were just a lot of untranslated words or phrases or even some sentences that I just, I couldn't, I couldn't draft in English. Um, so I decided to work around them while, that, while I did another pass through what I had. Um, and then I, I was going to get help. <laughs> so uh, first I looked at Agni Tennant's Toji translation to find out how she translated um, some of the terms that I was stuck on. And I was really lucky to have a full PDF from our library, the University of Toronto Library, you can download it in full. Um, and it was searchable, yes. Uh, but even so, I wasn't always able to find what I was looking for. And I figured out, um, you know, by, by kind of searching down scenes and doing comparisons that actually the, the Korean words were quite different um, in some instances to start with. So the head of the Che family, like the main kind of family that is the spine of Toji. Um, in, in when it comes to Toji, the, the head of the family has the title of Champan, which I don't know what it means. <laughs> but in, um, in this story that I was translating, it's Jisa. Um, and then in Toji, the, the main woman protagonist is called Kang Jongtek instead of Jong Um And it's kind of small things like that, but it, it was interesting to see the way that she was changing also, but also frustrating that I couldn't get help from this previous translator. Um, but it was helpful because in some instances I could confirm my kind of interpretation that I guessed at based on the way that she had translated um, the, same, the same scene. And in other instances, I was just really confused. Like there's a dish that I um, said it was meat, but she's written fish and why has she done that? Um, and, you know, I thought, oh no, I found this floor in this massive translation, but actually that was the right, one, I, I was being taught a lesson about how the meaning of words um, is different in different contexts and changes over time, right? Um, if you do shared labor for a village family, they're not going to give you meat for dinner, right? <laughs> the best you can expect is fish. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, the next thing that I did was to um, make my best I can do draft. And I sent it to my friend um, and former graduate school classmate, Chong Jinpyeong. And she had read Toji years before. Um, so we were able to talk about the kind of larger context of the story together. And she also grew up in a very rural place. So she was able to explain many of the details of rural life that Park included in the story. And we, we literally spent hours on Zoom together going through the manuscript. And it was kind of amazing because I felt intellectually engrossed in something for the first time since completing my my grad school coursework 
which I had to do in the midst of the first COVID lockdown. Um, and that was more than a year before. Um, so it was kind of this moment of, oh, okay, it's possible for me to think, <laughs> for me to kind of have these um, meaningful interactions as well. Um, so we had to correct a lot of mistakes and misreadings. Um, and we also had a discussion about how the two main women characters, Wilson and Zhang Lindek, they come across slightly differently, actually, in Toji, um, as they, uh, to how they do in the story. Um, I guess because they had more time and more focus in the story, they're slightly more like, what can I say, powerful, animated. Um, and so it was nice to be able to translate this, um, this short story um, and kind of give them that screen time. I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was finally able to send my translation uh, sometime after the deadline. And uh, then we started editing. Um, and when i mean the first time i was edited i think i cried a lot not this not this uh translation but you know the very first time for my first translation and uh yeah it's a scary process you don't know if the editor is going to like understand what you're trying to do um if you're going to have to fight for your interpretations or um you know trying to convey something that um isn't necessarily like smooth in the english or, or whatever um kind of idea they have um, but no this was um, like a really wonderful experience um, from over the years you know working with translating Korean into English it's a it's a real luxury to be edited by someone who is capable of being equally sensitive to the Korean and English text you don't said that she did a line by line right of the Korean and English and that is almost that almost never happens um, but also when it does happen there tends to be a kind of um, faithfulness to the Korean um, really strong feeling there but actually I felt like she maintained a really high level of regard for both um, and even an affection for both versions so I just I, yeah I felt very lucky and very grateful uh, I'm running out of time, so I won't say too much more, but um, yeah, I mean, the whole process, it, I think it spanned about two and a half months, the editing, and we went back and forth twice, and it was a lot of work, not just by me, but I like to think that it was it was worth it. I think it reads okay, <laughs> considering all the, all the con like, uh, yeah, all the difficulties um, that it went through, and uh yeah i guess that's what i should stop at and now we can hear from anton Haran. thanks anton. hey thank you so much sophie um i won't take up too much time i think a lot of people have said what i wanted to say i do want to uh, give you my perspective of this journey because i think it's slightly different from everyone else's so there is this conspiracy theory, there has always been this conspiracy theory in the past three years that Onford Star was preparing to completely translate Toji into English and would be the first um, English publisher to do so. From what I understand, this has never been done before in any language except Japanese, and that's just wrong. So how this star, how this began, um, on October 24th, 2019, Dasom Yang tweeted, um, I'm translating her, and while the process itself is a gift, I do need to find a publisher slash funding, crying emoji, but I'm sure you'll enjoy her. I'll keep you posted. Uh, she was replying to someone. I quote tweeted this immediately, and I said, so I've always had this idea regarding Toji. If, like the new Penguin Proof, a team of Korean translators divided up the volumes, if we can convince a publisher, we can probably cobble together the funding from both KLTI and the Toshi Foundation. It would be something of a logistical nightmare to assemble, but we have pretty much all of the essential parts. Anglosphere interest in Korean fiction, published Korean translators who are great at working together, funding for both translators and the Anglosphere publisher. Um, I sometimes feel like funding is half the battle and well, Dasum is already on it because I quote tweeted um, Dasom's tweet, where she says, uh, I went to the Toji Foundation this autumn and met with the director to discuss the funding situation, translation progress. Uh, and so like, so I knew like Dasom was talking about 
uh, you know, going to Toji Foundation and like seeing what kind of like opportunities in, in terms of funding what's there. And as literary, professional literary translators, so we all know that, you know, funding is, is like a really, really big issue. But all of the parts were there. We just needed, like, we just needed a publisher to pick it up. To my original tweet, uh, Onford Star replied, literally had this idea too, bulging eyes emoji. So I don't know. To this day, I don't quite know who runs the Onford Star Twitter app, uh, Twitter account. I don't know if it's Anthony or Taylor. Um, I do know that the Instagram app is run by um, uh, I, I, uh, Taylor's wife, but uh, that that one's new. But like the Twitter account, I still don't know who runs. Um, but yeah, so on, so Onford Star had tweeted on that day that Dasam and I were like having this discussion, very public discussion about like, oh, you know, this could happen. We can do it. Uh, on first I was like, oh, you know, I literally had this idea too. So this is where like the, the Toji conspiracy was kind of born, I feel. So to explain about the Penguin Proust a little bit and what I meant by that, Penguin has been publishing for the past 19 years, uh, I believe, no, it's 18 years. Uh, the last book, uh, uh, book seven of the Penguin Proust is gonna come out next year. And so it has taken 19 years, basically, for uh, them to publish everything from Swan's Way to um, Time Regained. Uh, and this is a huge commitment by a publisher. And maybe it's, you know, the kind of thing that only Penguin could do, where um, they basically hire, you know, a tr different translator for every volume of Proust. And they just had them create a contemporary translation of it. And now, like, um, with the publication next year, it will finally be complete. And from what I understand, um, another publisher, uh, I think it's W.W. Norton, don't quote me on this. Like, I think they're also like looking into creating another complete priest, this time translated by a single author. This is such, these endeavors are so, so amazing. Like if you look at for example, multi other multi-volume um, endeavors in translation, for example, Septology by Yon Fossa, translated by Damien Searles. Incredible, incredible achievement. Uh, Anne Goldstein's translation of um, the Elena Ferrante uh, Neapolitan novels. Um, so I thought, you know, I mean, Korea has epic novels and we have great translators and we're all really great at working together. Like, why can't we do something like this? This, is, this would be so exciting to do. Um, I initially thought that Dasam should do the whole thing because I, there's something just very romantic about having one translator, like translate like one author for like decades, you know? And like, it's, it's like a life's work of someone else's life's work. But Dasam is, you know, a young woman. She has things to do. <laughs> so we don't want to put like this huge burden on her shoulders. That's just too much. But I thought like, you know, it, at, at the very least, like Dasam should like, should maybe corral a bunch of translators together and kind of, because I feel like she is very, very close to the work uh, as, as she described in her presentation today. And so, yeah, so, there was always this kind of like conspiracy going on uh, with regards to Onfer Star. And so when Onfer Star came to me with this project, like they came to us individually, they did not announce it publicly at all. They were like, hey, Anton, so like we have this book, this Pakyongni book that we want to do. It's a short story collection. And we're going to have, you know, eight translators on it. And I'm like, oh, you're going to have eight translators translate a single book. That's really interesting. Yeah, and so like immediately I was like, I, I know, yeah, I know what you guys are doing. Um, I said yes, of course, because uh, I love Onward Star. Uh, this is my third book with them. I'm currently translating my fourth book with Onward Star as we speak. Um, I always want to work with Onward Star like for the rest of my translation career, if, if they'll let me. Um, I always want to have an upcoming book with them. The reason, so they also gave me like, they also asked me to like rank like the stories that you want. I only gave them one story that I wanted to do and that's the one that I ended up doing. And I chose um, The Age of Doubt because if you're gonna be in an opera titled Carmen, then you wanna be Carmen. You know, you don't wanna be any other character. Like you wanna 
be the biatch that's on the poster. So that's why I chose Age of Doubt. I mean, it is a great story and I love it. Um, but I felt like all of these stories are so great and, you know, I would have been happy translating any of them, frankly. Um, but that, that was kind of like the deciding factor for me. I know it's very crass, but this is the kind of person I am. Um, the other thing that was really exciting about this, uh, uh, this book, it kind of came at a point in my career where now, like, like before this year, um, every time I wanted to publish a book, it's like a huge effort. So I don't have to think about like what I'm going to translate, like, like very clearly, like, oh, this is the book I want to do, this is the book I want to do, and this is the book I don't want to do. And then I would like pound publishers with samples and, you know, proposals so that I would get them. But now I have books coming to me and I have other opportunities coming to me. So now I get to choose, or I actually, I don't get to choose so much as I have to choose. Otherwise, you know, I'm going to be working constantly and that's not, you know, my vibe. I'm a very lazy person. So I have to be like, I have to work on a project that is going to be meaningful in the long run and not just, you know, just be something for money or be something for just, just because someone gave it to me. I don't want to do a project just because someone gave it to me. I mean, a lot of translators uh, who are in the generation above us, the, the translators in this group, that's how they operated. And, you know, that was fine for that time. But for us, if we want, you know, longevity in our careers, we have to think in, the, in terms of like, is this work going to last artistically? Like, are we going to be able to do reprint rights for it <laughs> somewhere down the line when the head contract, you know, runs out of its time, whatever. And so, yeah, so for, so I have to be really, really choosy. So I have to, I have to choose a project that's going to be really, really exciting. And, you know, the, basically the Korean proofs, like, like that's that's what I'm going to suggest to Anthony and Taylor how to market this like you know Toji is like the Korean proof like you know this is what we're going to do so I kind of like wanted to it was it was part of like this whole like long-term thinking where I'm like I want to be translating 20 years from now and um, maybe you know we'll be working on this book together um I thought it would be uh so Regarding specifically uh, this project, I did not have as hard, or I guess not hard, but like I, I had a simpler time translating the story than I think uh, my other tra my translator colleagues here have had, only because I happen to work on Kangyang as the Underground Village, which is also published by Albert Star, uh, only because I happen to work on that book first. They're not contemporaries, Kangyong and um, but there, there's something very similar about their vibe where I was like, because I used Pearl Buck for the voice of um, Kang Kyung as character, uh, Kang Kyung as narrators in the underground village. And I think uh, I was like, I want to do something similar like that because they're both very, there's something about Pak Kyung who is, she's more subtle than Kang Kyung. Kang Kyung is very like, hits you over the head with it, but, and, and Pak Kyung Ni is, is quite intellectual and very kind of, I don't know how to say this, not spiritual, um, just more interesting than spiritual. Um, like she, her metaphors are, are very, uh, they're just very ineffable. There's something very ineffable about them, but um, she is kind of close to that kind of mid-century voice or early, early 20th century voice rather than a contemporary Korean voice. And I was already very, very used to that voice. I'd also translated Hwang Seo Gyeong because I translated The Prisoner published by Verso. And so all of these people who I kind of like lived in her time and, you know, so for me, it was like, oh, I just have to do that again. And um, the things like, um, I was kind of surprised with what um, Yu Jong said about K, uh, because, oh, so, I also want to add on to what Sophie said about like, I like Yu Jong really elevated uh, the translation with her edit. Like it's, I don't know about you guys, but like for, for my translation, definitely like she caught a lot of mistakes, A, and also like a lot of like tonal kind of things that are really, really essential. I feel like in translations and I kind of like when I submitted the first draft, like I was so busy this year or was it last year? Like, I was just so busy that when I submitted, it was the end of last year. Yeah, I was so busy, like, like 
you know, Chris Bunny had just come out, I love the big city had just come out and I was like living on Instagram. And so I had no time to do anything. I did this translation. And when I handed it in, I was like, oh God, this is kind of crap. <laughs> like even I could see that. But then um, when Yujun got back to me with it, I was like, oh, thank God, you know, she's like, you know, sitting there at the other end going through this thing because I just did not have time to process it. But so I'm very, very grateful uh, for all the work that Yujung did. And um, I'm also, I think it's also thanks to Yu Jong uh, that I feel like the the book is quite coherent, right? Like in terms of voice and tone, like the, of course there are differences between, you know, individual translators and whatnot. And, you know, the stories themselves are also, they're not, you know, written at the same time or whatever. So they're going to be different. But I felt like this is quite consistent. Like there's nothing, there's nothing grading about like the difference between each story. So I think uh, that's a huge editorial feat. So thank you, Yujong, for that. Um, I was surprised when she mentioned like Ke because my mother does Ke or did Ke until fairly recently. And I knew what Ke was and I didn't, like I was like, I just need to know how to gloss. I was like, oh, money lending club. Like, I think that's what I did for Ke. Like I did something um, and, and I didn't really think about it. And then, but you know, I my editors are more careful than I am. So <laughs> they have to look everything up. Um, so it wasn't, so, so much the terms uh, that were like a huge thing for me. Um, what I thought would be uh, interesting though, was um, when you get to, when you look at the volumes of Toji, there are 20 volumes, but there's a 21st volume and that 21st volume is like all the names and all the characters who appear in Toji, like that's a separate book just to keep them all straight. And so uh, that, that's what comes with the set when you order it online. And um, so that kind of like, that makes me think that oh like if we ever do this together like all the translators in this room and on the basically the back of this book like if we ever do decide uh, are are hired to do you know the toji and the conspiracy comes true then i thought it would be really fun if we did like a like a group trip like an mp like we like every everyone just flies to korea for a summer and for a week we just like go to some island here off the coast of Incheon. there are a lot of really nice ones we go to some islands and then we're like, we have our own cabins and then we come like, um, uh, who was it that was talking about cabins? Was it Paige? Yeah, so like we all have our cabins and then we all just like every evening we, we, we kind of like have a little seminar and we like decide on like what each term is going to say. Like, what is like <laughs> you know? So we'll just decide then like, this is what that is. Um, yeah, it'll be really, really fun. I think it'll be a really, It'll be a really ambitious project, and I think it'll be a really great moment for Korean literature and translation and translated literature. Like, it could be a huge, massive um, project, not just in terms of of its literary value. Of course, I mean its literary value is very apparent, but also to publicize what translation is, what a collaborative art it is. Translation is is you know, it's like filming a movie. It, it, uh, there are a lot of moving parts. It's highly collaborative. Even if your author is dead, like ours is, we're still collaborating with her on the page. So, and then we're collaborating with our editors, our copy editors, and the publishers, and all of that, all of that. So I and here it'll be like the added kind of layer where all the translators are collaborating with each other. So it's it could be like a really really fantastic, exhausting but really, really fantastic thing, uh, like the experience of a lifetime, if we can pull this off, and it would be an incredible, incredible work of art. So um, yeah, really, really hoping that Toji happens. And I'm very, very happy to have been part of this book. Thank you, Anton. And thanks everyone for your, um, yeah, for your thoughts and for sharing so much with us. Um, so I'll introduce our three discussants now and then let them take the floor. Um, Ali Ju Kim is a PhD candidate in East Asian Studies here at the University of Toronto. Her dissertation examines decadence as an aesthetic mode in literary narratives that relate to discourses of modernity and modernization, empire and capitalist expansion. Her other interests include memory, space time and family sagas. Uh, next up, Jessica Morgan Brown is a doctoral student also in East Asian Studies here at U of T. Her current research involves an interdisciplinary approach to vernacularization movements in colonial Korea. 
um, with a focus on erasures of gender, race and class inherent in dom dominant Hangul narratives. Um, Emily Wong is a Master of Information student at the University of Toronto with a concentration in UX design. She did her undergraduate studies at the University of Hong Kong, majoring in English and Green Studies. So Ali Ju, if you'd like to start us off. Thank you, Sophie, and thanks all for your wonderful presentation. I really learned a lot. I wanted to start off with a general reflection and a question on the title of this collection, Age of Doubt, which is taken from one of the stories. I found it a very evocative title for a, for a collection of stories that cut across a major historical events in Korean history, as well as Park Lee's own life. It really reminded me of Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence, referring to late 19th century America, and also Mark Twain's Gilded Age. It calls attention to the way that a literary title can capture or shape our perception of historical times in spite of not being necessarily a historical term. These short stories are written between 1955 and 1968, after the Korean War and before the Fourth Republic. It's also a very formative and prolific period for Park Kyung Lee as a writer before she embarks on her masterpiece, Toji. So to all of you, what does the title of the collection, Age of Doubt, mean to you personally? And how do you connect it with your own understanding of historical times that serve as the backdrop of these stories? The next question I have is on your individual experiences of reading. Uncertainty is the central theme in this collection. We encounter accidents, accidental encounters, missed opportunities, mistaken identities, medical mishaps, sudden deaths of family members, all these accidents. These accidents destabilize the lives of those already making a precarious living and result in the erosion of faith in people, in religion, and in science. Yet at the same time, the women in these stories exhibit immense willpower. And though faced with events beyond their control, they remain determined to live differently from the lives carved out for them. For me, their extreme gumption and tenacity in their lives was something very interesting. And which brings me to my question. Many people say that reading, reading is an immersive experience, but I found myself at times challenged by these characters who seem so paradoxical, fierce and vulnerable, proud and fallen down. And in your own specific positions as readers and translators, which might be local, international, gendered, or otherwise, were you naturally pulled into the stories or were you at any point jolted by a perspective or character in your story? Additionally, I'm also interested to know about your collaborative process. Um, this project involved eight translators from the things you've told us, it sounds like a lot of logistical effort into, went into bringing the group of translators together. But once all the translators were gathered, everyone was given great autonomy with their story. Paige described reading the finished collection to peeking into everyone's studio space. And that was a very lovely description that I liked. I'm just wondering, was there a reason that you didn't read each other's translation during the process of translating? Earlier, I was wondering how you keep consistency of voice and tone throughout the stories. And I was surprised to hear that the translative process was quite individualized because as Anton mentions, the voice and tone is quite coherent in all of the stories. And of course, there must have been a lot of many different moving parts that went into bringing together this work. So I'm just wondering why um, why the translative process itself was more individualized. And I wonder if um, there were any big discussions during the process of translating or any that happened afterwards. Another question I have is, um, you've told us some of your different approaches to translation as well as the difficulties you encountered like unfamiliar or anachronistic terms or family duties. But these difficulties can also be incredibly productive and meaningful. And I'm interested to know what you would regard as your greatest break breakthroughs or achievements on the translation that you did. Were there any parts of the story you're really proud of translating? Um, finally, I'll end with a question to Sophie. 
one story that really stood out to me is the sickness no medicine can fix, because though the story is thematically connected to the other stories in this collection, it is also the only story with a male protagonist, and it is set much earlier at the beginning of the colonial period rather than after the Korean War. It also takes place in a rural village. So I wanted to ask Sophie, what do you think, what do you think of this rural pre-war aesthetic of the story? The countryside is sometimes linked to ideas of authenticity or physical rootedness, but perhaps you have a different take on this story. And I'll end there. Um, do you want me to say my piece or do you guys want to answer Alleyju's questions first? Yeah, I think if we have each of the discussions um, give us a, the um, kind of comments and questions all together, and then um, hopefully we'll have time to each kind of give a bit of a response to what we had. Thanks. Okay. Well, then um, I'd like to start by just thanking everyone involved in the process of making this book come to life. Um, and it's just a beautiful introduction to Park kyung and post-war Korean literature for me um, as a scholar of the colonial era. Uh, so I haven't really read much past 1945, to be honest. Um, and usually I'm very early colonial era, so I haven't read a lot um, of that era, but it was really compelling. And um, I found the book compelling, not just because it's kind of a course in Park kyung stories and style, but you also, I was also able to see the development of Korean literature kind of after the conclusion of formal Japanese colonialism and the selections that were translated, I thought worked really well together to give the reader a sense of the trajectory of Park kyung writing throughout her career, um, tracking from the 1950s to the 60s. And I'm assuming that this trajectory culminates in Toji, which I now have to read. <laughs> so thanks for that. That's gonna take up a lot of my life, um, but I'm excited. Um, and as someone who studies colonial literature, it was fascinating to see kind of the various elements of Pak that recalled tones and themes and feelings present in a lot of colonial literature. And I especially found, um, as Ali just said, uh, the sickness that no medicine can fix kind of compelling because it, for me, it held all these echoes of Yi Hyo and all of these kind of components that I've read of so much in colonial literature, but at the same time, there was also this feeling of this freedom of critique that you don't see in colonial literature. And there's um, there's a point where they're calling, that I think it's Dr. Moon, he refers to the Japanese as maggots, and you would never ever see that in colonial literature. And so it was kind of refreshing to see from um, someone who just reads all of this kind of self-censored literature to finally see them set loose on how they actually felt all the time. Um, and so that was really interesting to see. It, it was kind of jarring at first, um, but I appreciated it. Um, and so I continually felt myself like itching to just like look at the original prose <laughs> because I'm I'm more of a, a linguistics language person. And so I really wanted to see also the breaks because you could see them in the story and the tone and everything. You see these breaks post-colonial era, but I wanted to see the linguistic breaks as well. So again, I guess there's more things I get to go look at later. Um, so thank you. Um, and I felt, I felt, I really felt the stories worked well collectively, but I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't single out Age of Darkness for a moment, <laughs> because, um, man, I'm getting emotional just talking about it, but I unexpectedly had a really, really strong visceral reaction as I was reading this piece, and I don't think I've ever had this when reading a translated piece before. Um, and it was just the story of a parent losing a child and you get these raw emotions of grief and anger and despair. And it's all coupled with this helplessness in the face of a greedy and crumbling medical infrastructure. And all of this shown in this beautiful translation. And I found myself crying more often than I care to admit as I was reading it. And this theme of loss, which is apparent in, like on the surface level, at a personal level is really obvious on the page, but underlying all of this, you also get this profound sense of a needless loss in the wake of colonialism and war and reconstruction era, capitalist greed. Um, and by the end of the story, you see that there are three generations of men in this family who have been 
taken too young. And the last one so young that he didn't even father a descendant before passing on. And this leaves behind three generations of women in this household to kind of carry on this feeling of loss. And it just all lends to this overarching sense of loss and loneliness, um, but also resolve and determination that is present in the moment described, but through the multi-generational loss, these emotions are then projected onto the colonial past and the uncertain future and all the post-war recovery that's happening in the moment. And I was just, I just, uh, I, I loved it so much. So thank you, Tassel. I really, really appreciated that story. I appreciate all of them, but I think that one emotionally destroyed me. So thank you for that. Um, and so thanks, thanks to all the translators uh, for making me a huge fan of Pak Yung Mi. And um, I would like to finish my gushing with just a couple of questions. Um, so first, kind of, it was kind of hinted at, but when you're making the choice between transliteration versus translation, what are the decisions that are going into that process? And as part of that, I was thinking about audience. So what kind of audience are you thinking of? So when I came across a transliterated word, like I'm fairly familiar with Korean literature. And so I did, like when I came across like maru or chokori, like I knew what those words meant. But if I had handed it to someone who didn't have a background in Korean literature, they would be a little bit confused. And so I was just wondering what kind of decision-making process goes into that choice between transliteration versus translation. Um, and then also, as I was reading, I was thinking a lot about temporality. And so um, for the last two works, especially, you have Puck writing about the late Japanese colonial era or the very early Japanese colonial era from the context of the mid 1960s. And now these stories are then being translated in the 2020s. And so in thinking about these complicated mixed temporalities and contexts, how do you approach that as translators? Do you try to translate temporality as well? And I, I think a few of you um, kind of hinted at this when you were discussing it, but it's just, it's such a huge task, right? Thinking about time and context and contexts within contexts and how all of that kind of comes out on the page. And I appreciated hearing about how you go into the process of background and context. So a few of you mentioned that you did a lot of Google searching and um, YouTube watching, and, and that was interesting to hear about. Um, and so I was wondering, do any of you delve into contexts um, outside of what you're reading, I guess? So I think, I think Paige talked a little bit about um, how she kind of familiarized herself with the context and then got to translating. Um, but I'm interested to know if any of you just kind of look at the translated piece and you expect the context to come out in that piece that's going to be important for translating that piece, or if you feel it necessary to know the whole background and then translate the piece. It's just different kind of methods that I'm interested in hearing about. Um, and then I think finally, many of you are very prolific translators. Um, who translate a variety of authorial voices and genres. And I'm curious to know your thoughts on authorial voice. And so do you attempt to ensure that the different voices of the different authors you translate are not affected by each other? So in other words, do you translate with your own authorial voice or are you always trying to attempt to capture an, the original author's voice and tone? And as such, your writing kind of becomes capable of juggling multiple personalities as you're jumping from author to author as you translate. And if that's the case, then where does your own voice factor into this? Because um, I miss I, a lot of you are writers as well as translators. And so how does this interplay between the voice you're translating and your own voice work? Thank you. I guess I will move on to me. So um, I actually find that the book structure is really helpful, like the way it is. Um, in chronological order. Um, I think it really represents um, the author's different stages in her life. And I can see like similarities between the stories, especially for the first four chapters, I remember. It's because um, I, re I really remember uh, The Age of Darkness and The Age of Doubt. Those two really stood out to me. And also the first two chapters, because the, there is such a change. Like the first two stories are about um, single women, um, like struggling to find true love because of their own um, standard. 
but then suddenly there's a tr transition to the age of darkness and doubt that's like so dark about um, hopelessness and loss. So I actually really like how the structure of the book is. And I think the commentary at the very back of the story is very helpful to give a refresher on all the stories, but also provides more foregrounds and context because when I was reading through the, um, the short stories, there were some instances where I don't really understand, like uh, probably there are some contexts which I missed or I wasn't really familiar with. So reading that commentary at the end made me realize that, oh, I probably should read the stories again to have like a better understanding um, of the details I missed. And um, actually, same as Jessica, I used to read more colonial stories. So I think that this um, collection of stories is really meaningful where I can look at the Korean War from an individual perspective, um, especially coming from a female figure. They, they experience very different kinds of trauma from the aftermath of war uh, because they have to live on. Like the, a lot of um, character, like the characters in her stories uh, have to carry on living, supporting the family, uh, be the breadwinner of the whole family. So I think um, like Park has like her, her perspective and her writing actually offers a more personal insight towards people's life and real sentiments after war. So as a reader, I think it's uh, relatable and more easy to imagine um, since the stories actually revolve, revolves around the main character's daily lives and event. Um, and I think compared to colonial literature, one theme that I... I, like one central theme that I can see the difference is the theme of love, where like in colonial literature, love kind of depends on the the the, the, the people's enlightenment desire, like what is good for the nation. Um, but in her stories, especially um, the stories that that's touch upon um, like single females ideal of love, it is more um, con a concept that's entangled in family relationship, even for the for the um, widowed woman as well, uh, figure as well. And I uh, I think so. That's why the last story is particularly interesting to me in the sense that it is in a completely different setting from the rest of the novels in this book. But it underscores the hardship of free love in a feudal society that's so bounded by traditional Confucian. Um, idea. So love across different ages just seems to be so difficult. And there seems to be no solution to any of these issues. And I realized that her, her stories all seem to have a tragic end to their romantic lives. Like the lack of happy ending in their stories is just really sad to read. But I think it taps into very realistic adversities women um, face during the post-war period. Um, and I have to say my most mem memorable story will be The Age of Doubt, because I think these, the ending actually surprised me a little. Like, I'm going to go into specifically like, when um, I thought the mother figure would actually burn down the temple, but then instead she burned her son's photo. So I was like, oh, that's kind of unexpected. Like, I like how pack stories are so, like, not predictable. And so that made me think, why did she choose to do that? Like, why did she make her character do that? And is that a kind of liberation to the female figure or is that like an inevitable surrender to the reality? So the ending just got me thinking a lot about the significance. And I think if I have the time in the future, I will reread the story and catch some more details. And um, regarding the questions, actually, I think, um, I think, uh, Jessica and also Aliju just like they, they they touch upon the questions I had already like I had the same question in mind with Aliju about the writing styles and tones like I I know that you guys don't really have the chance to read one another's work before the 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 formal publish uh publication of the book so how do you really like match one another in terms of style and tone and also Jessica's question about like how do you translate very old terms like when do you decide decide how much do you translate because I know some um like foreign translated books into English they would insert footnotes to explain the but I don't recall seeing any in this book so I guess maybe this book is targeted at readers who have some sense of um, the Korean history and background. How do you decide how much to translate or just simply write the Hangul term? Um, and maybe an extra question. I don't want to 
pose too many questions for you guys to answer, but um, uh, like just as Paige mentioned that how she has to look into the details or the information because she wasn't really familiar with um, the context. So how do you balance, um, strike a balance between what the writer is trying to represent and also your own imagination of this uh, context or this background when when you're not really familiar and you had to do research on? And um, and maybe maybe just like a, a, a more uh, informal question would be like how, what are your impressions on her stories? If you have not read her work, uh, her works prior to this translation project, I'm just curious about like, how do you find her stories? Like, what do you like and what's your favorite stories? And yep, that's all for my part. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, Daskira, and Ali Ju. Um, so we don't have much time left, <laughs> um, but I want to say that it's really amazing to hear from readers um, of this book and people who have read our work and have reactions to it. I mean, you're all expert readers as well, which is even more exciting, but um, yeah, also connecting with, with these stories um, in a really profound way, which is so wonderful to hear. Um, I'm sure we won't get to answer all the questions, but um, thank you for them. Uh, my suggestion is that we um, each kind of go around maybe one, two minutes each and try to um, answer one of the questions or a thought that we had um, hearing these questions and comments and, and then we'll wrap up uh, from there. Is anyone itching to go? first? Maybe Marco can go? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I can answer one question. I can try to answer one question that uh, both Jessica and Emily mentioned, and I can try to be extra brief. Um, so it was about transliteration versus translation and, and older terms. So it might be a complete cliche, but it really is a, for me, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So if the context allows it that you, that there's the reader might already have an idea of what's going on that you can then you have more chance to leave the korean word because they can figure it out by the context so that's one thing that's really important um and then i have a, a personal strategy where i if it's something um i check how obscure the word uh, is by just googling it like if it's a food item for example you type in tenjang chike or like the translated version you get it like first hit with a picture uh it's there you know so if a reader really wants to figure out it wants to learn something about korean culture and they just type it in they will get it immediately they don't have to do any, so much effort uh, if it's something that doesn't come up on google and it's really like hard to find even for me as a translator then i would never leave it because then if they wanted to find out what it is they won't um and i have one cool question a cool example from my text it's like uh, there was a sentence that said um school regulations were orderly like a baduk board and any other publisher might have edited that out and said like oh let's make this into a chess board and i'm so happy that comfort star doesn't do that because it's such a beautiful phrase and reference to like a korean thing that i would love to keep it in which i did would anyone like to go next um, yeah, that's all. yeah, I can just kind of pick up on that. I think, yeah, also regarding transliteration, I think I also left out a lot of words that felt very essential, I guess, to the to the text and the context um, of that word. So like I left out or I didn't leave them out, I guess I translated, literated them um, like words like aga or I grew, you know, like aga for me, it, it sounded, uh, it felt um, it was, it felt that it was pretty essential to kind of keep that word as it is, as a term of endearment that is very sort of specific between a mother and a daughter, um, or a mother and her child. Um, and aigu and and these these sort of like sounds uh, that you make that are very specifically Korean um, that sounded a little bit. I mean, Amato mentioned earlier if you had kind of translated sort of uh, anachronisms with like in English uh, dialect that it would sound a bit off um, and I think it's the same thing with um, certain words that you know if you had used the English equivalent of that it just wouldn't um, carry the the connotations and the meanings as well um, the other thing I think um, was it Aliju or 
for Emily or Jessica. I think it was one of the questions that was uh, posed about the voice of the, you know, getting the tones and the voices to sort of cohere at the end. I think a lot of that um, is due to Yu Jung's hard work and 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 also Taylor and Anthony's sort of um, being open to kind of uh, letting us sort of work individually, but also kind of also kind of like putting the trust out there that it will sort of that because I think in the end like it really comes down to kind of also trusting the sort of standards and the quality of translations that will be delivered so at the end that kind of um, worked for us and and, and obviously wouldn't have worked without Yu Jung's um, meticulous but also very uh, kind I guess uh, copy editing um, and uh, there were some other just questions that I wanted to address, but I don't want to take up too much time. I wanted to just quickly say thank you, Jessica, for your um, for your feedback. That was uh, it's usually you don't get to hear so much about um, from from readers directly, and it was really great that to hear that it resonated with you so much. Um, yeah, I think that's it for me. Can I call on Paige? Sure. I feel like I was doing the thing where you try to avoid making eye contact, but it's fine. <laughs> sure. Um, I thank you so much for the responses and all of the questions. I think one that I'm still thinking about um, is the question Jessica posed, and I think Emily seconded about um, temporality, dealing with the different times that are involved in reading, um, the writing, publishing, reading, and translating of the stories. Um, and I guess that also will tie into questions about context. Um, so I just wanted to say a little more about that, which is that um, I mentioned earlier, I'm not sort of institutionally trained in, in Korean studies or Korean history. And I especially was kind of wanting for the experience some of the other translators mentioned of having grown up reading Park Kim Lee's work and having grown up in school with it and um, having been exposed to discussions about it because I think that sort of context is, is so crucial for me as a reader of Anglophone literature um, that I was really wanting for a similar background and a similar relationship with the text before I dove into translating it. Um, so I think a lot of the research was compensation or was an attempt to get close to right, seeing these things. Or um, I also did read a lot of reviews or kind of reader response. I read a lot of neighbor blogs about um, people's responses to Pak Yang-mi's work and especially um, calculations. And I think that was the closest I got to having that experience of like growing up in a context in which um, we're discussing this story and reading and analyzing it together. Uh, so I think that helped me approach translating it. And I, I tried not to kind of find an equivalent, I think, of an equivalent writer in the Anglosphere. Um, and I know Anton mentioned, right, being able to um, maybe utilize elements of like Pearlbuck's voice um, for certain writers. And I think that I'm, I'm not as well read as Anton, but also that um, I didn't feel confident in doing that per se. So I think what I tried to do was um, not impose too much of my contemporary voice or an overly contemporary voice on the text, but also not um, kind of look around for more old-fashioned or try to force um, a time period on the voice um, because I felt like a lot of the content and the themes were right so still right kind of timeless and um, I think I tried not to make the story older than it needed to or date the story unnecessarily um, in the translation so um, I'm always excited to hear whether that was successful or not but I I think I'm still working on a process that would work for um, translating less contemporary pieces or pieces that are from a time that I just don't have access to other than through secondhand sources. So that was my approach. Thanks, Paige. We're going over time. I think we can maybe stretch to a few more minutes. So um, could Anton or Yujong, if you have, yeah, Anton? Yeah, um, I just want to say, oh, obviously we can't answer uh, too many questions. I just want to say that there seems to be something that uh, I just realized is not very apparent um, by reading the book or looking at the book or, you know, this two-hour presentation is that 
the eight of us, we actually um, know each other very well. And a lot of us are very good friends. We're all very good friends, in fact. Um, I've known Sophie and worked with Sophie for years and years and years. And we've all read each other's work. And uh, we all highly dislike each other as people, as well as respect each other's work and like each other's work and always cheer each other on. So I know that it's kind of like, it, it, it may seem strange that the eight of us would be working together or strange that um, the work would cohere as well as it does. But I feel like, I think Dasa mentioned trust. Like there, I never, I know it's called the age of doubt, but I never doubted that the other stories in this collection would not turn out, you know, as good as they did. Um, I just didn't want to be the weakest link. And so for me, it was like, when I was translating this book, uh, my part of this book, I felt like, oh, I, I, w I also want, like, if I had to imagine a reader for it, I would be imagining my other translators, the other seven people on this list. So that was like a very, very important element for me. So I just don't want that to be lost, like in, yeah, in our discussion, the fact that all eight of us are very good friends and very, very close colleagues. Yujong, is there anything, any of the questions that you want to mention or? Yeah, I mean, I was going to talk about, you know, the trusted thing, you know, among us, but I don't know what it did. And as an editor, you know, because I read all the translations before, you know, if it was published. One thing I that I noticed was like, we have kind of a trend and it's kind of transliteration. It, like I spot model in like Anton's and then later on it pops on like everywhere, you know, in other stories too. And I think I remember Anton saying this word like anti-colonism in one of his lectures. Like, you know, this kind of transliteration kind of enhances you know, the Koreanness of this book. And especially the Age of Doubt was written in 1950s, 1960s. So like we, I think we kind of subconsciously wanted to keep, you know, the Koreanese and kind of expand, you know, that feeling to English readers. So that, and we, you know, kind of, uh, and we also have a footnotes because, you know, some, I think we have only two or something because we, we didn't want to, you know, make our book too academic. So, but in some cases, yeah, I mean, if it's necessary, yeah, we, we respect, you know, our translators say so. Yeah, we have two footnotes, I guess. And, you know, everything worked out really well. I mean, like, it, you know, it was a wonderful process. Thank you, Yujang. Thank you, everyone. Um, I guess I'll try to just briefly um, answer Ali Ju asked about the, the Sydney's No Medicine Can Fix as this kind of rural pre-war aesthetic and what I kind of made of that. and. Um, I think it's a really good um, demonstration in this collection, actually, of how we have Park kyung kind of going back from the personal to and kind of getting further and further away to make sense of, of the things that happened to her and happened to her country. Um, so kind of once once it's happened, trying to make sense of what, what on earth has befallen herself, um, women like her and um, the kind of the rural village people that she grew up um, hearing about and, and learning about as a young woman. Um, and there was also a question about what kind of audience we were thinking of. And I do want to uh, address that because it's something that I think about a lot. Um, in a way, I think of myself <laughs> as the audience that I'm thinking of. Um, and I believe that a, write, a reader who doesn't care at all about Korean history or about Korea is probably not going to pick up our book. And if they do, they're the kind of reader that will say, hey, this is a word I don't know, let me let me look it up. Or just kind of go over it and let it like, you know, let it happen and see, just let it feel how it feels and, and see the overall effect. I think that's also a way of reading that I do myself as a reader when I'm reading things that I'm not that super familiar with. Um, yeah, so I think that's all we have time for. We do have 
we had a, a question that's kind of a comment, but it's a lovely comment <laughs> in the in the Q and A box. So I'm just going to read a bit that I really liked. Um, the um, uh, it's from Kansu, and they say um, it does show how beautiful and valuable translations can happen when everyone loves doing what they do and approach translation as an artistic practice. Um, and I think that really sums up. Uh, what a lot of us were trying to do and the way that the um, publisher at Homeford Star and also you John really respected our work and, and worked with us in a, such a lovely way that I think a few of us at least are willing to <laughs> keep going if, uh, if the opportunity arises and um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens. So thank you so much to everyone for making time and sticking around uh, for this long event. Um, and to our discussants as well. And yeah, I guess that's, that's it. <laughs> it was so nice to see you all together, bring my, bring my translator worlds and, and student worlds and <sighs> thanks. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sophie. Thank, thank you, Sophie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.